Oh, thank you so very much for the invitation and for the great introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, so my thanks also to Dr. Peter Gray and of course my close colleague and friend, Dr. Jenny Burns, as well as all of the faculty, staff and students at UNLV Anthropology for the invitation to present here today. Um, I am giving this presentation from Ithaca, New York, where I have lived and worked for 14 years. Ithaca is located on the traditional homelands of the Cayuga people, the people of the Great Swamp. The Cayuga are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on Ithaca lands and Ithaca waters. The Haudenosaunee, or the Iroquois, as many of you probably know them, include the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Seneca, the Tuscarora, and the Cayuga people. Uh, depicted here is the Hiawatha belt, which symbolizes the unity of the original five Haudenosaunee nations. They are connected by the great law of peace. Each white square and the tree in the center represents one of the original five nations. The white lines extending from one end of the belt to the other represent the path of peace, welcoming other nations to take shelter under the great law of peace and join the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The Tuscarora Nation, which is originally from North Carolina area, um, they're the sixth nation in the Confederacy and they joined after this particular belt was created. The Haudenosaunee exchanged wampum belts with Europeans to recognize treaty agreements. The two row wampum records the agreement made in 1613 in upstate New York between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch government. And so um, this is depicted here, this two row wampum belt. 2013 marked the 400th anniversary of the two row wampum treaty. And I just wanna read an excerpt from the two row wampum renewal campaign as written by members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The two row wampum campaign belt is a symbolic record of the first agreement between Europeans and American Indian nations on Turtle Island, North America. In 1613, this first covenant, which forms the basis of the covenant chain of all subsequent treaty relationships made by the Haudenosaunee and other native nations with settler governments on this continent. The agreement outlines a mutual three-part commitment to friendship, to peace between peoples, and to living in parallel forever, as long as the grass is green, as long as the rivers flow downhill, and as long as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Throughout the years, the Haudenosaunee have sought to honor this mutual vision and have increasingly em emphasized the ecological stewardship that is fundamental prerequisite for this continuing friendship. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Ithaca College. It precedes the establishment of the state of New York and the United States of America. So prior to my presentation, I wish to acknowledge the ongoing connection of the Cayuga people past and present to Ithaca lands and waters and the painful history of Cayuga dispossession. I am not sure if you or how many of you were aware that there was a very important conference um, being held sponsored by the Center for Experimental Ethnography and Penn Museum's Settler Colonialism um, and Penn Museum. And it was on settler colonialism, uh, slavery, and the problem of decolonizing museums. It was an amazing conference. I know that as a registrant, I'm able to go back and view previously recorded uh, materials. It was free and open to the public. And I'm uh, putting this out there in case you missed it, um, that maybe you, you can still get on their website and have access to some of the presentations that were given during this conference. I mean, of course, in the, in the course of a multi-day conference, there's going to be hours and hours of uh, conversation about museums and skeletal collections in museums and other institutions. And so here I'm just offering my small contribution uh, regarding the importance of reflexivity in working with human skeletal collections and assemblages. Um, this draws on my work with skeletal collections associated with impoverished segments 
of Black and European immigrant populations in the United States. Uh, therefore, it is not inclusive of all of the populations, in, including indigenous populations who have been dissected and collected in the United States. So I, I just want to address this bias at the fore of my presentation and make clear that this in no way diminishes the experiences of the many people who share similar postmortem interventions in the United States as, as well as internationally. So Foucault, I love Foucault. Um, Foucault first introduced his concepts of heterotopia in 1966. A keynote address on the topic was delivered at an architectural conference and eventually published and translated into English as of other spaces. Uh, Michel Foucault described heterotopias as real places that are separate and different from all of the other places within society. They are like societal countersites that are not freely accessible. People must meet specific criteria in order to enter, or they may be forcibly placed into heterotopias. Foucault introdu introduced two main types of heterotopia. So there were crisis heterotopias and there's heterotopias of deviation. Foucault defined crisis heterotopias as privileged or sacred or forbidden places that are reserved for individuals who are in a state of crisis with respect to society and the human milieu in which they live. On the other hand, heterotopias of deviation were spaces in which individuals are put whose behavior is deviant with respect to the mean or with respect to what is considered the norm. Some heterotopias, such as nursing homes, may be considered on the border between a crisis of heterotopia and a deviation heterotopia. And this is because, you know, debility and frailty associated with old age could be considered a crisis, right? That individuals have the potential to, to get over. Um, but the failure to work, right, within this um, American work ethic might be considered a deviation. So it kind of sits on the border between the two. Of particular interest to bioarchaeologists is that Foucault similarly describes cemeteries as heterotopias with souls that are in crisis, right, in, in, in the midst of transformation and bodies that are in deviant decay. He states, as an example, I shall take the strange heterotopia of the cemetery. The cemetery is certainly a place unlike ordinary cultural spaces. It is a space that is, however, connected with all of the sites of the city state or society or village, etc., since each individual, each family, has relatives in the cemetery. But we know that this, not, this statement is not entirely true, right? Not all members of the United States society were or are deemed worthy of burial space. Thousands of skeletons have been relegated to a lab or mortuary space, typically associated with sites of higher education. Such mortuary treatments certainly may be deemed as heterotopias, like a societal countersite that is separate from the rest of society. But what are the specific criteria that are required to enter the museum or lab mortuary? or to be forcibly placed in heterotopias. According to Foucault, modern states use biopower, which Foucault defined as techniques for achieving the subjugation of bodies and the control of populations to proliferate life. Heterotopias function to sequester into other spaces many different kinds of people who did not fit into what is culturally desirable. The early development of physical anthropology within the United States is intimately tied to the study of anatomy and therefore human dissection. The accumulation of individuals who were dissected 
as part of the educational training of future doctors, anatomists, and or anthropologists. Cadaver dissection and experimentation were fundamental to the advancement of studies of human variation and anatomy. We also know that much of the dissecting and collecting of human skeletal remains during the 19th and the 20th centuries fed the white man-made race science machine. As George S. Huntington put it, his collection would render possible a thorough comprehensive, uh, excuse me, a thorough comparative study in reference to racial character, variations and reversions, measurements, etc. The Huntington, the George S. Huntington Anatomical Collection, the Robert J. Terry Anatomical Collection, the Hammond Todd Osteological Collection, the W. Montague Cobb Skeletal Collection, and the Johns Hopkins Fetal Skeletal Collection provide just a few examples of those who were dissected, collected, and are now stored in our museums and institutions. The use of these skeletal collections in education and research has advanced many fields related to anatomy and anthropology. However, the socially sanctioned use of unclaimed cadavers in their development has resulted in the overrepresentation of the most impoverished segments of society. Knowledge of the structural violence, the acts of biopower that led to the inclusion of particular individuals within these heterotopias of deviation requires current anthropologists to critically reflect upon the power dynamics and impacts of their research. Most United States skeletal collections were amassed as part of a racist agenda. Anthropologists who conduct research on these skeletons or are educated using these skeletons, which there are many, many, many biological anthropologists who are educated using these skeletons, uh, must continually practice anti-racism or we are essentially contributing to the racist agenda of the collectors. W. Montague Cobb was the first Black biological anthropologist. He self-identified as African-American with maternal Native American ancestry. In a critical departure from his predecessors and many of his contemporaries, most like all except for one, <laughs> uh, Cobb's interest in the formation of skeletal collections centered on addressing the social determinants of biological health in black populations, as well as other communities of color. He was an engaged anthropologist. He was an applied anthropologist. So Cobb sought to empower the voices of black scholars as authorities in studies of anatomy and physical anthropology, and therefore on matters of race and human biology. Cobb's approach to a non-racialized understanding of human development and biological diversity included both teaching and research in biological anthropology and anatomy. Sorry, I just went a little fast there. Okay. Uh, and also advocating for equal access to healthcare facilities for Black physicians and for Black patients. Therefore, Cobb embraced the potential political impacts of scientific investigation on combating pre-existing notions of race. He strongly believed that sound science would not only influence the academy's approach to the study of human biology, but would serve to hasten social change. Cobb's anthropological investigations were consistent and deliberate acts of bold resistance to the racist agenda of the physical anthropologists, anatomists, and medical doctors that dominated these disciplines in the early and mid 20th century. 
Cobb earned hundreds of accolades and awards during his many years of contributions to biological anthropology, to medicine, um, and to the public. I don't think I mentioned that he was a medical doctor as well. Um, so he had his PhD in biological anthropology and he was a medical doctor. Uh, but the, there's great disparity between the current recognition of Cobb as a scholar and authority within the black medical community and biological anthropology, right? So the National Medical Association has named an institute in Cobb's honor, right? Um, many biological anthropologists remain completely unfamiliar with Cobb's extensive works. So his contributions have been minimized or silenced altogether in both graduate education and even in the histories of, of physical anthropology. Um, and it it's, can be quite disturbing to see even when there is a mention of W. Montague Cobb in you know, chapters on the history of physical anthropology that it sometimes can be limited to one sentence, um, especially given, given the importance of his work. As I was preparing for this talk, I came across this picture of W. Montague Cobbs uh, examining Jesse Owens, right? The great Olympian Jesse Owens. Um, this is from the Getty Images website. Um, it's in fact, it's a really well-known image of Cobb and Owens, but um, the caption reads, American collegiate runner Jesse Owens gets his feet examined after pra track practice on August 13th, 1935. Uh, this caption serves to dismiss Cobb completely uh, and his many contributions to the fields of medicine and biological anthropology, effectively erasing Cobb from, you know, Cobb's scientific knowledge. It also renders invisible the power of his anti-racist scientific authority and, and the active resistance to racism that is transpiring in, in the transaction between these two Black men, right? This is not a Black physician examining the foot of a Black athlete. These are two Black men who are actively engaged in resisting racist ideology. And that is completely dismissed from, from the captioning that is provided. So the relationship of United States anatomical and, and documented skeletal collections is, is intimately tied to race. And although Cobb and his mentor, T. Wingate Todd, actively sought to disrupt these racist agendas, this was not the norm. So then, Getting back to the question, how does one become an object on a museum shelf or uh, in a laboratory drawer? For residents of the United States, you are forced into this heterotopia if you are poor, if you are black, if you are indigenous, if you are a European immigrant of questionable morality, if you have been disabled by your society if your body is unclaimed. Uh, and I think it's, it's really important to understand that unclaimed does not mean that, that, you know, there were not people that loved this person, right? Unclaimed can mean that you did not receive the death notice in time, right? For some cities and some districts, if you did not claim a body within 36 hours, um, then the body could be given over to the state, which was then often used in um, universities and in medical institutions. And think about this, right? This isn't, this isn't 2021, 36 hours. This is, you know, in the mid 1800s, in the early 1900s, 36 hours is hardly enough time to be able to, to claim a body. Um, unclaimed could also mean that your loved ones could not afford a burial. So being deviant, that from which is desired to increase the nation state's life force, um, the healthfulness of our United States nation state, 
that is what gets you into the heterotopia of deviance, which is the museum or uh, university lab space. It is important, of course, to recognize that there are individuals who did will their bodies during this time period, um, but they, they are very small in number compared to the number of individuals who are impoverished in these particular collections. Um, and so these individuals did not enter mortuary spaces such as cemeteries. Um, their mortuary space was a museum or a laboratory. In many cases, this means separation of the body. It means being poked and prodded and, and write it on, write it on, written on, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I and many others have addressed dissection and, and collection as an act of structural violence, right? A postmortem form of structural violence. But this begs the question, well then who are we, right? Who are the biological anthropologists who now conduct research on these skeletal collections? Are we not contributors to, to structural violence? And what about many of the biological anthropologists and bioarchaeologists who are educated on osteology using the skeletal remains from my marginalized and minoritized groups in these heterotopias of deviance? So we need to reflect on these questions in an effort to engage in ethical anthropological practice. This includes reflection on the subject position as a biological anthropologist or one's subject position as a biological anthropologist, but it also includes an examination of the other social identities that we possess as researchers, right? So, so I am white, uh, I'm cisgender, I'm heterosexual, I'm a citizen of the United States. I have impairments, but my society doesn't disable me because of those impairments. I am first generation college educated, but I do have a PhD, right? So with all of these identities comes a great deal of unearned power and privilege. I am exceptionally honored to be one of a handful of scholars who was permitted to complete my dissertation research on the W. Montague Cobb Human Skeletal Collection. The lessons that I learned at Howard University extend beyond any analysis of, of human skeletal remains. My workspace within the laboratory at Frederick Douglass Hall was the same space that served as the temporary mortuary for individuals from the New York African Burial Ground, which is the oldest known cemetery of enslaved Africans and their descendants in the United States. The tremendous responsibility of bioarchaeological research and its contributions to historical narratives was palpable in this sacred place. Uh, these early experiences at Howard University would be fundamental to shaping my philosophical approach to anthropology. It is here that I began to fully reflect on the very young discipline of bioarchaeology and what my contributions were going to be. In addition to, to working on anatomical skeletal collections, I have also conducted bioarchaeological research on several poorhouses. So the Monroe County Poorhouse in Rochester, New York, that's where um, I had conducted my master's thesis research on that poorhouse. Um, the St. Lawrence County Poorhouse in Canton, New York, and the Erie County Poorhouse in Buffalo, New York. I advocate strongly for the exchange of knowledge and ethical considerations between biological anthropologists who conduct research on anatomical collections and those who engage in US bioarchaeology. In the United States, the same processes that led to the collection of thousands of impoverished people and mar uh, marginalized and minoritized people also led to the desecration of cemeteries of the poor and of the institutionalized. So bioarchaeologists have become increasingly invested in the reconstruction of cultural identities and of lived experiences through the complex and careful contextualization of human skeletal remains, right? This is what we do. Um, this includes investigations of the body politic in which the body is a medium through which power relations are performed. 
vital to these interpretations is the mortuary context, right? This provides us with evidence for individuals' social roles based on burial location, uh, burial type, the position, grave goods. But mortuary treatments are not confined to burial spaces, right? They include those practices in which bodies have been prepared, altered, macerated, dissected, and or mounted and stored in museums and other educational institutions. So bioarchaeological research of mortuary contexts that consist of drawers and laboratories and university basements may add significantly to our understanding of the social identities and the values assigned in life and in death to those who have been dissected and collected. In addition, there's a relationship, right, which I've already alluded to, <laughs> between bioarchaeological research and skeletal collections with many bioarchaeologists receiving education on human osteology from anatomical and documented skeletal collections. Um, therefore, it's ironic that the same level of interrogation that is found in bioarchaeological research has only recently been applied to non-archaeologically derived skeletal collections. And I think that there is a, a unnatural separation that is created be between these two lines of inquiry, right? And, and there really are very few of us who are or who have engaged with an interrogation of the social processes that led to the creation of collections and whose scholarship is really designed to make visible the lives of individuals who have been dissected and collected. So instead of using these anatomical collections in an attempt to create um, new, new, new measurement schemes, um, we're, we're really trying to make visible the lived experience of the people who are in these skeletal collections. So now I, I want to propose a further intervention that I find to be helpful in thinking through research on human skeletal remains from United States sites, be they archeological or museum or, or institution based. So I served on the Institutional Review Board for Human Participant Research uh, for, for seven years. I'll now refer to that just as the IRB, so I don't have to say that long name multiple times. Uh, the cultural folks out there, if there are any of you, are likely very familiar with the IRB. Uh, IRBs are charged with identifying and evaluating the risk of harm associated with research with research related to human participants. So the inclusion of scholars and community members on the IRB committee, right? So, so committees have to include non-scientists and they have to also include scientists, but they also have to include um, committee members who are not associated with the institution. So this invites a wide variety of perspectives and expertise that provide insights into the potential challenges to research. So it's my experience that IR, the IRB that I was associated with anyway, uh, very thoughtfully assessed research proposals, providing both speculations and consultative comments that were aimed at reducing the risk of harm for living human participants. And I've always found it very strange uh, that the vast majority of research involving human skeletal remains in their context does not require approval from a federal compliance committee, any, any federal compliance committee. You know, we have federal compliance committees for animal care and safety. We have federal compliance committees for biosafety, and we have federal compliance committee for assessing risk to human participants. So, you know, now we have NAGPRA, which is an exceptionally important piece of legislation. And, and when practiced in an ethical way um, is 
is great in that um, Native American tribes are now acknowledged and seen and respected as knowledge pro producers and that um, our efforts to repatriate or rematriate human skeletal remains and sacred objects should, of course, err on the side of Native American knowledge, right, when done ethically. Um, but there is no additional legislation to guide our efforts in ethical research, um, to guide our other efforts in, in ethical research. And there is some conversation, right, about having, um, certainly about having changes to NAGPRA, because there are problems with the legislation, um, but also having an AGPRA, which would be for African American burial spaces. Um, but a lot of the research that I have conducted is on European immigrants um, who are living in extreme poverty and then are used for things like anatomical dissection, right? So, so we, we need a bioarchaeological ethos that extends beyond that, which is legally mandated. And we shouldn't w be waiting for laws to engage in, in ethical research. So, you know, as a member of the IRB committee, I've read proposals from marketing professors about, um, you know, the nostalgia associated with toys and from psychology professors who talk about how humor can mitigate stress. Um, I've also examined research on the benefits of, of group therapy for sexual assault survivors. So the proposals that are vetted by the IRB vary significantly in terms of topic and in terms of, of the degree of potential harm. So as bioarchaeologists, we recognize that human skeletal remains that we examine are a part of a much larger political, economic, and social context. Um, yet we proceed largely unchecked. Uh, if we acknowledge the potential for profound impacts of skeletal analysis on living human populations, then why are we not responsible to federal compliance committees as are our colleagues in cultural anthropology? So Martin, Herod, and Perez, hi Deb, um, proposed the adoption of an ethos in their text, Bioarchaeology, an Integrated Approach to Working with Human Remains. Um, in their work, Martin and colleagues suggest that bioarchaeologists transform the underlying ethos of our research in order to engage with the larger context within which human remains and artifacts are connected. So in the context of the United States, this means understanding the role of race and racism in the formation of collections and in the excavation of bodies. So it as, is at this point in the process, before any field research commence, commences, that I suggest an IRB framework may be a useful tool for the practice of ethical bioarchaeology. I'm not suggesting that bioarchaeological research should go through IRBs prior to research. They wouldn't have any idea what to, to do with us, in all honesty. Um, but I am suggesting that some of the tools that IRBs use can be helpful in reflecting on our research prior to its commencement. So I'm going to just highlight here some of the points of articulation that I see um, between um, bioarchaeological ethos and components of an IRB proposal. So the Ithaca College IRB, as an example, has developed this decision tree to assist our faculty, students, and staff in the determination of whether or not their research requires IRB approval. So the initial page of the decision tree poses the following question. Does your research involve human participants under either of the following conditions, right? So an activity that involves a living human whereby a researcher obtains data through interaction or intervention with an individual or their environment. 
And two, does the or is it an activity in which a researcher obtains data containing identifiable private information about a living human? Okay. And this is potentially already where bioarchaeologists and biological anthropologists might get stuck. Okay. So as suggested by DeGangi and Moore, uh, research that uses human skeletal remains is not under the purview of most human subjects institutional review boards, right? Because the subjects are no longer living. I absolutely agree that IRBs would agree with this statement, right? That bioarchaeology isn't under their purview. But is this really a valid one? So first, bioarchaeological research most certainly involves human participants when one considers the inclusion of oral histories and ethnography in the um, contextualization of human remains and in our building of community relationships. In my most recent research in the Caribbean, local archaeologists assert that their research does not and it cannot conform to traditional European and American models of archaeology. Their work we begins with what they reference as the intangible, the stories of enslaved Africans and their descendants that pass from generation to generation. The rich cultural context that is communicated through the descendant population is imperative to any research on the island. Research that involves documentation of oral history in which individual opinions and emotions are integral. So, Activities such as these should seek IRB approval prior to commencing research. Having said this, the majority of scholars may describe our subject matter as the skeletons themselves, right? So then the question is, are human bones living human participants? Uh, do we as bioarchaeologists recognize human life in the skeletal remains that we analyze? Uh, while many bioarchaeologists may view human skeletons as objects, or inanimate text, the personhood attributed to skeletal remains is integral to many cultures throughout the world. Um, if we are to adopt an ethos as proposed by Martin and colleagues, then the ethical treatment of bones as individuals is an imperative. Our opinion, my opinion, as to whether or not human skeletal remains are living human participants or subjects is not completely irrelevant but it's significantly less important than those of the cultures and the local communities to whom we are responsible. If it is probable, or if it is even possible, that human remains are living humans, then should we not consider the adaptation of the IRB protocol in order to flesh out the possible benefits and risks of our research? Among the additional concerns of the IRB is the benefits or justification for research. So according to federal regulations based upon the ethical principle of beneficence, it is required that the risks of harm associated with research are reasonable in relation to the potential benefits, right? So at Penn's conference this past week, Joseph Jones, who is at the College of William & Mary, really considered this question as critical to the consideration of excavation analysis. So in each particular instance, is bioarchaeological analysis going to provide us with details of the lives represented from the skeleton that is not present in the documentary archive? Um, many researchers have a tendency to reduce the IRB process to that of informed consent. And while informed consent may be helpful in biological anthropology research, it's not the major, I would not call it the major contribution of the IRB process. Uh, the major contribution is that the IRB requires an assessment of the potential risks of harm in the proposed study. And the IRB does not believe in anything such as no risk of harm. So not only do our researchers required to identify and consider risk of harm, researchers must identify the practices that they will employ in order to mitigate those risks. So to properly assess risk, of course, we have to begin with an identification of the descendant and living communities. In the case of bioarchaeology, 
The risk of harm to descendant and local communities may be significant, including emotional distress and traumatic memory. And what happens to our data once it has been disseminated? Can our research affect uh, multiple people in, in negative ways? So once harms have been identified, it's necessary to propose practices that reduce violations and violences. Um, there are lots of positive outcomes to NAGPRA, okay? One of which um, Martin and colleagues explain is the, that we have to be able to explain our research um, without using a lots of technical jargon. So we have to be able to explain the value of our research outside of academia. And one of the best means that we can, one of the best ways in which we can reduce risk is by cultivating relationships with communities in which we work, right? And that can only talk uh, happen if we, we speak the same language. So we can also adapt informed consent, informed consent of IRB proposals reiterates the purpose, the expected outcomes, the benefits, the procedures and methods, the risks and practices that will mitigate harm, uh, and modes of obtaining additional information about the study, right? Why can't these things be reproduced for living and descending communities? There are proposed bioarchaeological investigations in which the risk of harm to living populations will outweigh the benefits. Um, we don't have to cut and run in this case. Um, there are alternative positive outcomes to bioarchaeological research that do not include the analysis of bones in the laboratory. We can employ the same methodologies at a site um, that we do not fully excavate and still learn much about mortuary treatment and contextualization. And so for the goals of the archaeologist may then switch to preservation, memorialization, and commemoration of the burial site. So where do we begin? How can we possibly know where to start, right? Um, the thing is that for, for nearly 30 years, we have had a successful model for descendant and living community-driven research. The New York African Burial Ground Project provides us with a clear model for how to conduct ethical bioarchaeological research in the United States. Michael Blakey and colleagues provide us with what Blakey calls a um, clientage model, one in which the descending community need not be scientifically identified, right, or defined, but a social descending community, kind of a surrogate family. And in this model, the descending community is the decision maker. The research questions are those proposed by the descending community, right? Not a body of researchers with no connection to the human skeletal remains. So even with all of this reflection on possible harm, there's likely to be what the IRB refers to as adverse outcomes, right? So researchers are required to report these instances of harm back to the IRB. Of course, the value in negative outcomes is that we learn from them. Uh, wouldn't it be great to learn from each other regarding the challenges that we face as biological anthropologists and as bioarchaeologists? Um, you know, just in a, not just in assessing a skeleton um, for scurvy, I mean, that can be difficult too, but but also for engaging in ethical practice, we're really lacking this in, in the literature um, and the potential to be vulnerable um, and, and talk to each other to better our practice. So in the course of writing this piece, it also occurred to me um, that it may seem as though I'm overly familiarizing myself with scholarship or, or even me, right, myself, um, with Black scholars uh, and their important contributions to this field. Scholars such as W. Montague Cobb, Michael Blakey, Rachel Watkins, Carlina De La Cova, uh, Joseph Jones, Asia Lands, Mark Mack, Fatima Jackson. This is not my intention. On the contrary, I speak these words to myself as much as I do to you. Uh, it is an essential part of my process and my reflexive 
practice that I'm sharing with you to acknowledge, review, incorporate, and uphold the intellectual power of the work of Black scholars on human skeletal collections. I ascribe to the idea that as a white person, I must consistently engage in anti-racist reflection and action. Otherwise, I am being racist. Um, reflexivity here challenges me to recall all of the moments in which I have embraced racism in my work as a biological anthropologist through my failure to acknowledge that I have been socialized in a white supremacist society and all of the benefits that have been afforded to me because of this. So this is a really great time to be a biological anthropologist. Um, I know that there's a lot of controversy and a lot of talk going on right now, but this is the best time. It's a hopeful time, right? It's a time in which we have the ability to flip the script on what it means to do biological anthropology and bioarchaeology. We've inherited a discipline that is steeped in racist ideology and structural violence. We have the opportunity to alter the role of bioarchaeology and biological anthropology's interventions on marginalized and minoritized peoples by placing the needs and desires of communities first, particularly lineal descendant communities and social descendant communities. And this means prioritizing efforts to repatriate, rematriate, or otherwise return human skeletal remains. Uh, thank you so much for your time and I'm really looking forward to discussion. Wow, Dr. Muller, that was just fantastic. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, so we'll shift here to uh, Dr. Martin Deb has a question for you. Hi, Jen, thank you so much for doing this overview on ways to think about skeletal collections and bringing theoretical perspectives such as heterotopia and locating the historical racist agenda against the backdrop of work like Cobb, which was anti-racist but buried. How can we train a new generation of PhD bioarchs and forensic anthropology PhDs now? How do we move all biological anthros in the direction of a new ethos and being ethical? The pushback to these progressive agendas is strong. P.S. Thanks for shout out to BioArc Text. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Also, did you notice? I, I only just noticed this now, but there's like a whole row of your books right there <laughs> from your series. Anyway, um, so it's a great series, by the way very important series. Uh, so one of the first things that I think has to happen is we've got, we've got to start including the work of Black scholars in bioarchaeology. And I don't know if this means that we start, I mean, writing textbooks, as, like, as everybody knows, is that it is a hugely time-consuming task but um, the fact that a lot of Black scholars are going unrecognized in bioarchaeology is, is very problematic. Um, I, we've got to address this. I think that incorporating some of the things that we traditionally think are within the realm of cultural anthropology and not biological anthropology um, that needs to be part of our education, particularly for graduate students. So teaching bio, bioarchaeology students how to think reflexively, I didn't get that training. Um, I mean, I know this was some time ago, but I, I don't, I, I think there's such an emphasis on um, you know, how do you recognize pathological conditions in human skeletal remains? And, you know, how do you create a biological profile and how do you analyze trauma? And not enough time is being spent on the reflexivity and, and other ethical considerations for engagement in, in bioarchaeology. I think this is really lacking in our education. I also think that we have a problem in that we don't recognize this work in tenure and promotion, 
right? Um, there's, you know, tenure and promotion is a lot about publication and it's not a lot about curating skeletal collections, which is extraordinarily time consuming or, um, you know, assessing damage within human skeletal collections. So, so that we are in a place where we can start rematriating and repatriating skeletal remains. So unless we, we fix this so that we can recognize the work that is required for rematriation and repatriation, we're, we're not going to be able to dedicate the time to graduate students to teach them how to do it, right? Because then we're, we're spreading ourselves too thin in terms of trying to do this in that publication, but also do this work of rematriation and repatriation. So those are, those are just a few a few ideas, but I'm really hopeful. And, you know, I think that I, I'm, I'm impressed and, and hopeful about this new generation of, of bioarchaeologists. I think they're far more advanced than at least I was at their age <laughs> in terms of thinking reflexively and thinking about engaging in the anti-racist agenda. Brilliant thought. Yeah, my first awakening actually many years ago was realizing that there was an African American burial grounds in New York, and I never learned about it as an undergraduate or a graduate student. Could be argued one of the greatest. I, I mean, it, it was stunning to me. So thanks for doing it. We have another question from Liam Johnson. Many biological anthropologists increasingly turn to skeletal collections from taphonomic facilities to potentially mitigate some of issues of classical U.S. skeletal collections. However, many of those same problems exist in these modern collections, uh, for example, who is donating their bodies and still using unclaimed remains. Can these collections represent a turn in heterotopias of deviance, or are they our generation's iteration of these historical collections, skeletal collections rooted in racism? Great talk. Loved it. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, I get concerned. <laughs> that it's the new version, the new generation's versions of heterotopias of deviance. I mean, I think that if, body, if bodies are willed to science, that is one thing. In situations in which bodies are not willed to science, I don't think that we should be using them for educational purposes. And I don't think that we should be using them um, in museums or any other sort of educational facility. You know, there, there is, there, there's a lot to unpack and think about here too, because it's not just about, and I might be going off topic just a little bit, but it's not just about anatomical collections. It's about what are the skeletons in your lab right now? There's a, um, in the lab that I use, I share, uh, it's shared between biological anthropology and biology. And there's a number of human skeletons in there that I don't know who they are. I don't know where they're from, nor, they're, nor does biology. There's no documentation associated with them. Uh, and I don't allow my students to use them. Um, I don't know that those people actually wanted to be researched. Um, and, and so I think it's inappropriate for us to use them for educational purposes. Think about the casts that we have, right? And this is like, I'm on my own journey, okay? So things that I thought were okay a little while ago, I'm not thinking are okay anymore. But I have skeletal casts in my lab that I have purchased of people who I, I have, there's a, a Native American skeleton or a skull of a woman who was killed in a car accident. There's um, an Australian Aboriginal skull. Um, they're not, it's not the actual human material, but these casts were created using actual human material. Folks like us who have been in these fields for a while, 
are really rethinking what we're doing. That that's the right. big movement, right? So we have um, four minutes left. If anyone has a final question, or Jen, if you have uh, some comments you want to end this with uh, this terrific talk, uh, feel free. Well, I can just say, ho hopefully, maybe another question or comment will come in. I know that when I was in school, I still am um, kind of on the quiet side. So I just want to, to say, you know, my email is here. Um, so if anybody has any questions, comments, concerns, I'd, I'd really like the opportunity to talk about this. I think this, this is a point where we really need to be discussing these issues. Um, and creating plans for how do we move forward. And so I think it doesn't matter where you are if you've been in this discipline for 40 years or, you know, it's your first year of graduate school or you're an undergrad student. Um, we, we need to be sharing our thoughts and opinions on this so that we can do better. We can be better. Yeah, actually, Jim, we have one last question. We have two minutes. This is a two minute question. From Kathleen Stansbury, it's a good one, but two minutes. Uh, thank you so much for your fascinating, engaging talk. How do you see bioarchaeology responding to scholars opposed to repatriation and rematriation? So I've gotten a lot of this um, in, you know, um, when thankfully I've not been excluded from publication, but I often get in my reviews um, for a publication, like, I don't like this. Like, why are you talking about collecting skeletons as structural violence? Like, you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and I think that um, this is something that a, a lot of us who write about this experience. Um, so I'm very, I am fully aware of the huge amounts of opposition to this way of thinking. Um, and the bottom, the bottom line for me is that um, it's not, this is, this is the ethical thing to do. It is the right thing to do. Science cannot be privileged over other ways of knowing and understanding the world. And I think that there is this tremendous fear that descending communities are anti-science. That is not true. And I, I again think that the New York African Burial Ground Project, I mean, it, it was an example of what not to do until Michael Blakey and many of his colleagues took over that project. But this was a case in which you know, Michael Blakey explained, if they wanted us to never analyze any of the skeletons, that would have been what we, what we did. We would have done that because that's their right as the descendant community to say, no, we don't want our skeletons analyzed. But they did, right? It's incumbent, it's our responsibility as bioarchaeologists and biological anthropologists to explain the positive outcomes of human skeletal analysis, right? What are the things that we can provide? What is the information that we can give you through analysis of the human skeleton that you cannot get in any other way? And if descendant and lineal and living communities still don't want human skeletal remains analyzed, then we have to give them back. Um, I'm, I, and I don't mean to be like, I understand that there's going to be a lot of opposition to this, but I really think that we are being racist if we do not give human skeletal remains back. Um, yeah. And on that final note, thank you so much, Dr. Mahler. This was just fantastic. Thank you and so from much. Everybody here in our department in the ProSum, we really appreciate the time that you uh, spent on this and, and your insights. These are really, really critical. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was great talking to everybody. Just terrific. Thanks so much, Jen. Thank you. Bye, everybody.